Hello, everyone. My name is Sandeep, um, and I'd like to welcome you to um, the first of the many webinars um, on uh, enterprise data and API strategies. Um, in, in this is uh, the introductory webinar where we explore uh, the history of data and kind of use that uh, to look at some of the concerns that architects have when they are designing API platforms um, and see if we can come up with a few suggestions uh, for architects uh, who are looking to build their uh, new spanking cloud native API platform. Um, so please, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Ken, um, who is a data management consultant, comes with a storied background of having done this uh, for a long time. Ken, over to you, please, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Um, uh, sure. Well, thank you, Sandeep, for the introduction. Um, if you're, I know some of the people who are already uh, here, but if, um, but just for those who don't know me, I started my career in a risk management consulting role at Deloitte. I actually earned a CPA and I've been a C-level tech exec in many firms, including uh, Cook Industries, um, Enron, that's a whole nother story that we could uh, have a webinar about. Uh, I've run uh, ran technology for bond trading desks on Wall Street, and uh, and I was the founder of a successful um, medtech startup. That is uh, interesting, and can't wait to um, uh, you know, dig into some of the insights that you have for us. Uh, for folks who are um, joining one of my webinars for the first time, I'm Sadeep. Um, I'm the field CEO at Hasira, uh, which essentially means I get to talk to um, experts in the field like Ken and with users in our community uh, who are looking to learn along with me um, just to kind of understand what's going on there in the uh, ecosystem of data and API tools and uh, what the uh, the next few years are going to look like. Uh, there's a lot going on in our space and uh, yeah, interesting times ahead. Um, and, and with that, um, it's maybe a good idea to think about how we got here in the first place, right? Um, I don't know about you, but if you've signed up for uh, any kind of uh, newsletters for tools and um, if you're noticing trends on LinkedIn, Twitter and so on, it just looks like there is an avalanche of data, right? There's data everywhere. Um, and um, I think my, my favorite anecdote about how we got here is uh, from uh, a fellow architect in uh, Singapore. Um, and uh, uh, he explained to me that, or rather his, his opinion on this is that it's, it's, it's the migration from state A to state B, um, you know, whether that's uh, from private clouds to public clouds, breaking down a monolith into a set of microservices um, that gives every architect, every engineering manager the opportunity to ask the question, am I using the right database for this use case? Should I switch over to a new one? Turns out a lot of them say yes to that question, that internal monologue, and end up choosing um, a new database or end up copying data from the original source. And certainly that organization is for the lack of a better word, littered with data everywhere, right? Um, and and that that's maybe just a trend. Can thoughts on this? You, you've seen this happen, right, in multiple uh, a cycles. Couple of, a couple of things that come to mind from the from a little bit you shared. Um, one is since this is about API strategies, one of my one of my arguments is is that data APIs are different. They have different concerns. You need to think about them as a subset of a, of a perhaps a larger API strategy that requires some specific um, responses to them. The second thing I'd say is that picking those tools is is all good and fine, and uh, but I think and, and not to denigrate anyone's capabilities, but that's the simpler part. The real issue is. Systems last on average from five to 10 years. And during that 10 year period, everything's going to change. I, I, I'm everything, right? <laughs> the data sources that are associated with it, they're definitely going to change, right? 
the environments are going to change. You know, it might be on private cloud, public cloud. Next day, they'll be talking about hybrid cloud as the next big thing, right? Um, the client expectations, all kinds of constraints are going to change. And the bigger issue from an architect's perspective is how do I manage change, right? It's a little bit, it's important to pick the right tools, but it's more important to understand how does how does picking that right tool and managing change all come together so that I'm so that I'm making a good investment in data technology over a 10 year horizon. Mm -hmm. I, I like while you were saying that, can I just imagine? I just went back the the last few years that I've worked and tried to imagine what storage computing and network looked like back when I started, right? Not yeah. one of that that is familiar. I think networking's the probably the more like constant in in our world, but the rest of it does not look anything like uh, uh, it did when I started. So I, I I get what you're saying. So, but but, but I'll bet some of those systems you worked on are still there. <laughs> some of them are there. Some right. Them, so like, what, they, what are those people cursing you, or are they happy with what you did? I mean, I haven't. You're dealing with how do the how do you change what you did, right? I I guess so. I haven't seen any uh, any any DMs or uh, LinkedIn messages uh, calling me out for my crappy code, but uh, I mean, must have been well. But but overall, the core system did remain same. I I, I totally understand what you're saying. So you've seen this change play out, right? Uh, of engineers and architects kind of introducing a change, trying to build a system, a system that lasts five to 10 years. And at, as this five to 10 year window is playing out, more change is being introduced into the system. Um, okay, that, that, that makes sense to me. So um, it looks like handling all of this change is complex business. Uh, not all of your systems uh, not all of your systems will be able to keep up with this change. So mm -hmm. is there a role for humans to play here, Ken? Like, like for example, yeah. um, as someone on your team, well, I, is there I, something I can look out for? Sure. Developers, architects all have a role in understanding and responding to change. Um, to me, I, I would use the phrase de-risk. You have to understand how to de-risk an application. It's not going to, it's not going to likely lasts for 20 years, right? But it's a question of how do I extend its life to maximize my return on investment and extract the most value from that, right? So a couple of things. One is architects, and I can't tell you exactly how to do this. It has to do with your- Is this the art? Is this the art that you develop over time? Um, yeah, yeah, it's probably the- A bit art. of time. And experience. It's Having been in an industry or in an organization for a period of time, you have to be able to predict where change would be. If you're just going to try to de-risk every possible outcome, it's not going to work out, right? You're going to probably end up creating more complexity than, um, than is warranted, and you're actually going to reduce the value of the asset that you're building. Um, I think, so that's the first one, and that's the one I can't tell you what to do, but that's the first thing you need to do is you need to predict where will change likely happen, right? So you want to kind of, kind of want to score, you kind of want to think about your areas of change and score them, you know, from top to bottom in what you think you need to de-risk. Yeah. The second thing that I'd say is, and this is more, this is just sort of software 101, but the more that you can reduce it down to a data, sort of a pattern that you can describe in data, that's sort of your standard approach, right? Is can I move the entire, can I move the entire definition of this thing into metadata or some significant portion of it into metadata and then build utilities that operate against that metadata, right? Then when change comes, ideally, just change the config, right? And and like, right. and I, I guess the art is to realize when to kind of go deep into that versus just doing what is needed, right? And yeah, I can't tell. Yeah, you. 
it's just going to happen. You'll probably figure it out yourself over time. But I think, I, I don't think it's like any great mystery. That's the general approach or one of the key approaches to de-risking against change is to move towards a metadata or configuration driven approach. But you can't, you, if, but if you overdo it, you'll, exactly. you know. It's not going to work. Not do the thing you're supposed to do in the first place, right? The use case that you're trying to solve. You're building this hypothetical system. But but I, I, I get this, right? And I think the first place that I, I jumped to when you said, uh, you know, stack rank, uh, where you expect change to come, top of my list is humans. Uh, let's say customers will ask for one thing today, next week yes. or next month, it's something else. Um, that's one example of a change. The other example that I thought of is, let's say um, traffic. My application is in beta stages today. I expect hundreds of users. Tomorrow I'm going to funnel a lot of marketing dollars into it. I, don't, I, I don't like risk people. against load, um, yeah. right? And, and we all probably know the, the approach doing that, which, um, yeah. um, which is popular today. Um, features, things yeah. like um, kind of a dumb idea, but let's say, a customer wants to get a data set in a specific okay. format. It's probably pretty easy to just just turn that into a flag and have multiple you know code paths that turn it into alternate formats, even if they didn't ask for it. You can kind of put that okay. in place. It's a very small change, and you've de-risked uh, that that idea that, that they or someone else may ask for it in an alternate format. Understood. Yeah. I think I think I, I can sense where the strategy is kind of going to evolve, right? Because in an enterprise, you're going to be in a multi-stakeholder, multi-consumer kind of environment. Um, so it it helps to be the kind of engineer who can just stay one step or a couple of steps ahead of where the requirements are and be able to. The other the other thing that occurs to me is, I, I when I've had developers report to me. I've sometimes become a little frustrated because they 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 don't they don't use their own creativity to try to to do simple things to de-risk the software that they're writing, right? And so I think as an architect, you need to set the right tone, establish the right guardrails and boundaries, and and ask people to use their brains, right, to create the best product, not not too much. Right. right again, it's an art. But as an architect, if you're too narrow in your in your in too prescriptive, it, it you're really not going to get the the most from your people. If you're too right. wide, you're going to get a lot of misfires. Right. You get, again, right. you got a Goldilocks approach to get the right amount of discretion pushed down to the people who ought to make those decisions. Right. Right, makes sense to me. I think I'm I'm just imagining like a bunch of knobs across uh, three categories: people, process, tooling. Right. As an architect, your it's I think fundamentally it's your job to understand what your teams like, what their skill levels are, are they capable of being creative or bringing innovation to the table. In which case, maybe you ease off a little bit on the constraints, but uh, you provide them the guardrails and uh, the the tooling, perhaps. Right. And I, guess that's I remember the this hard. story. I remember this story that's really funny. Uh, or I thought it was really funny. Um, I was telling a colleague, uh, another CIO, this was, the, I was a divisional CIO. There was another divisional CIO. I was talking about someone who worked for me. And I, and I said, uh, they, you know, they, they thought that they should do it this way. And I disagreed and I let them do it their way. And this, this colleague of mine was sort of like aghast. I'm like, no, I mean, like, even if it's wrong, I'm trying to develop this person so that he can understand how to take risks, make choices, et cetera. I was like, I, like, I didn't think it was the downside was that big a deal. And, and the upside was I'd have a better employee. So again, I think thinking about managing people in turn and the, and giving them the right amount of freedom to make technical choices again, to maximize value and de-risk for change is is sort of been my um, sort of always what I've been striving for. Understood. I'm, I'm sensing some sports analogies here, like a coach and an architect kind of operating in the same way, right? Yeah. Um, 
line that that tracks i mean um uh, all right uh, it's maybe time to kind of shift our focus to um before we move on i'd like for people on on the webinar i just want to kind of summarize that um uh, change triggers multiplication or duplication of data um that has happened multiple times every new system introduces multiple triggers and uh, that in a nutshell is how we ended up in the universe that we are in uh, lots of data everywhere uh, but uh, not too many strategies to train them in um, i wonder if we deduplicated all the data in the world how much would be left <laughs> I, i i think of i think a lot less than where we are because Um, you you and i both know the stories of organizations where uh, the global cio of a fortune 50 company is telling teams do not etl do not share gdpc access across team boundaries and so on uh, a, a, a a track that we will get into in in a in a few minutes um i suspect there's a lot of it i suspect if we got Uh, that person from AWS who uh, went around smoking cigars and asking people to build service boundaries. If he did unleash the small army of that in the world, I think, yeah, we would be left with uh, fewer, uh, yeah, chunks of data than we currently are at. Um, all right. So that brings me to the next topic, which is. Uh, what are we building towards ken um we we looked at this this very chaotic complex data ecosystem that every enterprise is um and we also know that like architects are trying to build um newer sets of apis api platforms and so on what's a good end state to to kind of aim towards right like what what are the concerns that one should be mindful of when trying to build a strategy before we get to the actual strategy it makes sense to um maybe see what the boundaries are uh, see what the constraints are and see what we need to account for um so i i think where you're headed is um trying to catalog the the constraints requirements etc that people you kind of have to um start thinking through and balancing in developing your your overall strategy right um, and can i i know that you've uh, done a fair bit of work articulating these constraints right i I've, i've i've seen some of the literature um that that you've uh, kind of produced um with respect to the supergraph architecture pattern um which which tries to first enumerate these these constraints um uh, uh, and and you know uses the example of an api marketplace to uh, to kind of contrast an api platform um as a very useful um a uh, device to understand these constraints uh, would you, would you care to kind of use the same analogy in in today's webinar as well and and take us through what these constraints might look like um <clears throat> Well, first, I like the marketplace analogy. I do think it has pros and cons that we can kind of think about because I think if you take it too literally, you're going to maybe do things maybe not ideally. Yeah. Um, I, I think the idea of being able to surface your data APIs in some consistent way that is discoverable that you mm-hmm. might define as a marketplace is a good is a good sort of vision to have i think i think where it goes wrong is that if you really think of them as discrete products um and you're not understanding how they relate to each other you're going to end up sort of building apis or data products kind of for an audience of one and i think this right. is where the marketplace doesn't quite work out right it feels like i'm creating a widget and and selling it but those widgets are never really useful unless you can combine them with other things um yeah. right so i what i think you want to do is you want to focus on a marketplace of reusable apis mm-hmm. right? so that you're you're kind of selling legos right 
<laughs> so that so that people can then build, you know, they can build, you know, uh, the, you know, the Star Wars, you know, ship, or they can build uh, Star Trek, or they can build, you know, the castle, you know, uh, or whatever for their particular needs. So what you want is to, to focus on the end of building sort of a marketplace of Legos where exactly. consumers can come and then they can build those one-off things, those those things that are, that represent sort of narrow use cases using mm -hmm. these reusable products that you sell through your marketplace. Now, in order to do that, you have to have standardized products in some way. This means you're going to have to have some organization that understands how to create standard data products or data APIs, right? right. Also, um, ideally, this idea that these things need to be able to be connected in some way. So you might want to have services associated with your APIs, say for data composition or data aggregation, right? right. So right. that so that again, a consumer can say, oh, I want A, and I understand it's related to B. So I want to create some composite data set. And I actually don't want the detail. I actually want these aggregates off of that data set. That to me is a powerful idea. If you can pull that off, then you've created this uh, a data marketplace that can that can be really hyper efficient, can be very responsive to change, and can uh, it can really create you know a, a delightful experience for those consumers. Right. I can. I I love this idea of reusability. And I think it goes hand in hand with the idea of, as a consumer, me being able to self-service my data requirements as yeah. unique and as snowflakey snow as they might be. If the platform's built for reusability and, and this kind of select what I need, integrate however I want, uh, the pace at which I can work, um, I, I, I can totally see that getting turbocharged. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. That, think, that, think about the impact if you don't have that. What happens is, is the data producers keep getting these narrow requests being pushed to them. You start yeah. ending up with this explosion of APIs or, or data sets or data products, whatever you want to call them. And the data producers become overwhelmed with, with dealing with all of that and ma making sure that all of those, those narrow APIs are consistent, right? Because if they're yeah. not consistent, people are going to start arg you know having concerns about well, this this thing on this API gave me this number. This thing in this other API that was seems like it's the same thing gives me a different number. Trust is going to be lost. People people won't trust the information you're providing through this data marketplace. They're going to start building you know all kinds of systems on their side to right. validate your data. They may even cleanse it and produce other variations of the data to even create more confusion, right? Exactly. So, so I think this idea of, um, of reusability is so important because it has multiple kind of reasons why it, why it um, improves efficiency, right? It's exactly. not just that it's not just that you're doing less work as a data producer. It means that consumers are getting consistent results. It means that data requests are being handled more rapidly. It has all kinds of implications associated with it. Understood. Understood. That that totally makes uh, sense to me. Um, and I also like. I think if if I take a step back and look at what you just described, right? I I love the way the 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 shortcomings, notwithstanding, the we are in a position to identify different stakeholders, people, let's say, who are operating this platform. I call them the marketplace team. There are API consumers, there are API producers or data producers, and each of them have unique concerns. And as a marketplace, if I were Amazon, I want to make it easy for people who are selling as well as buying yeah. while inculcating trust. That to me is a mistake. Yeah. I think I think you need to think about all of these personas that are part of this larger ecosystem, right? right. I, I can go through a few of them and, and talk about some of their concerns, right? On the uh, consumer side, 
they've got all kinds of very valid reasons to prefer different protocols, transports, and formats, right? Right. Ideally, in your data marketplace, you just want to abstract all that away. You want to say, I don't care. Like, you want to have a JDBC connection? Great. You want to get a REST API? No problem. I want GraphQL? Happy to do that, right? If you can build that kind of, if you can build that sort of abstraction in your data marketplace where, where protocol, transport, and format are just a client decision, I think you're going to, I think you're going to uh, have done a really good thing. If you're yeah. the domain or the data producer, you have people have to respect that they have specific constraints that they're dealing with. There's history that they have to deal with that creates constraints, choices that were made, right? That they weren't right. involved in, that they now have to live with. There are oftentimes applications that that uh, vendor applications that are required that force them into certain platforms and technologies. Domains have to be uh, have to be able to optimize their ability to produce data products, but to a standard, and that gets back to the marketplace team, they have to be able to define the standard and say, domains, you're free to optimize the delivery of a data product, but it has to be to a standard, a standard that makes data products consistent and interoperable, right? Right. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I missed someone. Oh, I, I have another one, operations, right? Right, so what one of the fascinating things is, can you provide evidence around how this marketplace operates so that support people can actually effectively manage uh, data flows? And ultimately, if you're in a regulated industry, um, regulators, auditors, lots of people will have an interest in the way information is flowing through this larger ecosystem that you're building. And all of these people are critical. And if any of them is unsatisfied, you're not going to be a happy camper, right? As the owner of uh, or architect of this 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 larger ecosystem. I, I, I can instantly see parallels to an actual marketplace, right? You want to have intelligence for sellers. You want to have intelligence for buyers. The marketplace itself needs intelligence, fraud detection, stuff like that. And yep. it has to be underpinned fundamentally by... Um, auto auditable operations that are going on in the marketplace. That that makes sense to me. So I'll kind of building up towards trust, right? Fundamentally, it'll come down to that. Um, that's that's uh, that's a very good uh, kind of takeaway. Um, is is there? And I, I I guess speaking of trust, right? Speaking of different quote unquote parties coming together, different producers coming together, different stakeholders consuming from what seems to be um, a reputable, trustworthy, single source of truth of our data. Um, is, is, is there an overhead in terms of governance and security that the marketplace needs to provide? How does one kind of think about that vis-a-vis -vis domain ownership and independence? I, I, I get, there's a little bit of art here, right? Which is how much this <laughs> Actualize how much right. domains, etc. I think it's going to be very dependent on the industry and the organization that you're part of. But there is some role. There must be some standardization to pr provide consistent experiences, consistent data products, and in particular, interoperability. If you use my Lego example, right, we got to know what's the size of the little dot that has to fit into the other piece. And if you don't do that, if your dots are different sizes, you can't fit yeah. the pieces together anymore, right? That, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so <clears throat> I, that's a hard one to answer. I think it's one you have to figure out on your own, but there must be some level of standardization. And, and one way to drive that is to create services that those domains can use. Right. So if services are able to dial up a database, dial up an orchestration tool, dial up ML and AI models, right, to build data products um, from centralized services, I think I think that's going to be a more frictionless way to create standardization, as opposed to just paper standards that somehow people have to figure out how to solve. Understood. 
understood and um, understood okay um that's a good way to kind of think about this um how how does this journey pan out again so it it looks to me and i'm again uh, as as someone who's read uh, your literature on this right one one key aspect that stood out for me is you want to think about this as the the products team or the catalog team at amazon right which is trying to see hey what data products or what products in the case of amazon are getting used can we discover the need for new things are are some things not getting um requested or purchased anymore but people based on the search history i can tell that i don't know ai based robots are the new popular thing um so I, 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 let me uh, let me sort of guess where you're headed with that um i think that this so maybe back up for a second i don't think this is an idea that you do after you've perfected everything else you want to put this in place early in the process because this mechanism, this conceptual thing we're talking about, um, it's going to be the way to discover demand, discover how people are using these products, and that's going to help you mature your data domains and mature your data products. I would argue, don't do anything. Put this in place, connect what you have to it, and use that as the mechanism to then improve. I think one of the key problems in many systems is not having thought through the feedback loops so that you can make improvements. You must have a complete feedback loop and it must be a positive reinforcing loop. And so I'll refer you to MIT's systems theory course, which you can all take, which does a great job of explaining systems theory but you can have negative reinforcing loops which, where trust is lost and people just stop using things, positive reinforcing loops that increase demand and make people kind of come onto the platform. I'm, I'm sensing an element of change management, right? Basic change management. Start small, get people used to the system, give them a voice in, in the building of the system. And more importantly, the evidence that you spoke about, right? Just share it with all the stakeholders. Let them come to the conclusion of this one tiny flywheel working and let it slowly expand. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty good operating model uh, for someone driving such a quote and good big change. That small, build it uh, with stakeholders. It is. It's hard. Like, like I don't want to minimize it. There's just a lot of tough choices and a lot of mistakes that you, you'll likely make. But I think if you start with a, a good um, overall vision around how you're going to build systems and processes and operating models to create that flywheel effect, you know, then you, you're kind of at the next level of architecture, right? And systems management and data management. I understand. Well, uh, Thank you for that bonus content, Ken. But that brings me to the all-important question, right? Um, we, we, we spoke about how to kind of introduce this thing into the organization, but what is this thing? We, we spoke about reusability. We spoke about standardization. We spoke about consistency of experiences for all of the personas that we have on our screen. How do you, how do, you do it? Like, how do you build this thing? Sure. Uh, so I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and, uh, and and so it's also probably why you're hosting this event and I'm here, right? Because um, uh, Tom McGopal, the CEO of Hasura, and myself has spent a lot of time working on the Supergraph architecture. And, uh, and I think there's papers written on that Supergraph architecture, which you can certainly read. Uh, I don't know, you might share those uh, links with people later. Um, I think that the Supergraph architecture is, is a good way to think about building a data marketplace that actually will function. I think people often, and I'm not, I don't, I, I don't think they're the exact same thing anyway, but people too frequently reach for, let's buy a data catalog, put it in place. I don't think a data catalog does what I'm describing typically. Um, 
And so this is a little bit more tech facing. This is more about how to engineer systems so that they automatically provide this positive reinforcing feedback loop that allow you to mature over time. Data catalogs just don't quite hit the mark for me. They might be important. They, I think they could be very useful for business involvement and understanding what's going on, but oftentimes they are sort of passive metadata. I'm describing a system that's based on active metadata. The domains are creating metadata that is used to operate the system, right? And because, because that metadata is used to operate that system, we can learn from it and improve it. So one way to kind of think about the, the passive nature of a data catalog's metadata versus the active nature of what you're describing is one gives you a snapshot of the system. The other is actually the system. Yeah. And one gives you a list of endpoints or data products. The other is describing and also a runtime of that data product. Is, is that a... One way you can think about, and I just to more uh, more silly ways to, to talk about this, but you know, one <laughs> way to build trust with people is to say what you're going to do and then do what you're going to say. Well, if the metadata is your story about what you're going to do, and then you build systems that act that that act on that metadata, you are guaranteed to do what you said you would do. Right. And so, I think I think this idea of using metadata to describe a system's operation and build utilities or factories that operate against that metadata is a great way to both build trust manage change, going way back to our earlier conversations, right? These are all hard things to do, but I think if you think deeply about it, you can do it. And I think that there are some vendor tools that have the same mentality uh, and approach to doing this. And if you think about looking for vendor tools that have that sort of, um, that sort of philosophy, you can also perhaps supercharge you know, building uh, building out something that would do something similar within your organization. Understood. And 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 I know Ken, we are going to talk about data catalogs and the role they have to play in this access layer. How do you kind of collaborate with them? How do you integrate with them to drive some of the uh, the demand discovery aspect that we spoke about? So we'll get into more detail around that. But um, yeah. yeah, I think all this thing we're talking about could certainly become the source for a data catalog. Okay, okay. But, uh, but, but I, I'm talking about something different than that, of course. Right, and and that's the the metadata driven federated data access layer. Um, I I think we we understand what the responsibility of an access layer is, and I think you've been kind of alluding to metadata and configuration kind of driving this runtime. So I'll move back to our diagram and add your federated data access layer here. Um, would you like to take us through yeah. this? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, for, first of all, <clears throat> Having this idea of a federated data access layer, uh, the phrase federated is intentional and it's there for a, an important purpose. The primary authors of the metadata are the domain data producers in this architecture. So they produce a data product. They then create metadata to describe that data product. You can just think of it as a data contract, right? Uh, because we're all on different, potentially different systems, Right, those data contracts have to be specified in what I would describe as platform agnostic terms. Again, that might might go back to some of the standards that the federated team has to establish, right? The federated team has to be able to consume all of the metadata from those domain producers, validate it, right? And then provision one holistic universal data access layer based on that. Right, along with those services that I'm describing. So all those services should just come along for free. The domain producers don't have to worry about it as long as I as long as those domain producers are not only 
indicating what their data products are, but also identifying the inter and intradomain relationships with them. Again, that all gets published up in the federated layer, and then, right, it's it's validated, provisioned, and those services come into play so that the consumers can come and do all the things we discussed. Understood. I, I can see why it kind of starts to contribute to becoming a data catalog as well, right? Because once you've got all these domain teams indicating their data products on this standardized metadata, that metadata in some sense is more or less an active so. catalog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's it's just different when you approach people and go like, oh, we're building a data catalog. We need to get access to your databases. We're going to scan them. We're going to do this. It just flips the script on them. It goes like, no, you tell us what your data products are. Here's the format you need to tell us. And then rather than, and then, but it, instead of saying, oh, and we're going to build a data catalog, which they don't probably really care about, we're saying, we're going to put all these value add services on top of it. And it's going to make, make your life so much better because you're not going to get all these crazy requests back, right? Because right. the right. service layer is going to help offload a lot of that work from you. It just completely right. flips the script and improves everyone's, you know, enthusiasm to deliver against this. Understood. Yeah, that, that exchange of service kind of between the marketplace and the seller, I guess, to continue using that analogy, uh, makes this a very different equation than saying, I need things from you. Can you do this for me? That, that, that makes sense. Yeah, it all starts with, we're going to help, you know, we're from corporate, we're going to help you. Um, with, <laughs> it probably isn't a good starter. But it all starts with the, we're going to help, you know, this is about helping you to manage workload within your within your domain, right? And and maybe some safeguards as well in terms of how the domain can be used. You know, like maybe some of the, uh, the services that you mentioned are also aimed at the, the producers and giving them the guardrails that no one's going to bring your data source down by running, I don't know, like a giant query against your database. Yeah, all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of other potential improvements from the domain or from the data producer's perspective. So not only are they providing their data products, they can also su supply um, security mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. those data products. And then the federated access layer can manage that for them. Um, uh, they, uh, anyway. Um, I, yeah. That you know, answers question. my question. Yeah, you know, but, but I, I can guess where this is going. And I guess a part of that service is also to provide consumers, because you've standardized, made this consistent, those Lego blocks uh, coming to picture now. As a consumer, I get to pick and choose any particular type. I don't care which domain it's coming from, but I can select it. I can aggregate it. I can integrate with another data type. And that's the that's the efficiency output of this platform, right? The speed at which the consumers can yeah. operate. So yeah. that, that, that makes good, sense to me. Right? Yeah. And I also like the, the idea of this federation, right? Where the, as an operating model, it's very clear for different kind of teams that what your responsibilities are and what your privileges are that you can iterate independently. You know what metadata you're producing, what changes in your domain will result in what kind of changes on the metadata, and the the guardrails, the, the, the CICD systems, et cetera, can be provided by the platform so that individual pieces can contribute to the whole and provide more value than just the sum of them. So yeah, for me, for me that makes sense. I, I, Love to understand more about the runtime aspect. I think the the differentiation between a passive catalog and this, right? Um, uh, is is this is is this the place where, as the data access layer builder or or architect, I I'm not trying to provide a runtime for this data access layer, right? Um, I'm you're like, well, a, you're I'm, like a gateway or password. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of considerations, right? So I would have said that it sounds a little too good to be true. There are a lot of things you have to do 
to make all this work, right? Yeah. So, so first of all, the data requests are, are being handled in a data in a decentralized way. The domains must be responsible for serving their data. If they're not, right? If you were imagining this as we're building some big enterprise data warehouse and we're moving data to it, that's a very different set of responsibilities for the domain producer. Those domains must be capable of serving their data as required, right? Not ad hoc. We can still establish guardrails around what, what, what requests can come to that domain, when they can come to that domain, but they still must be prepared to serve that data. And so that's that's a that's kind of a gotcha, and it might be a different kind of perspective than doing a centralized data warehouse, right? Um, the other thing I'd say is is uh, and that means the federated data access layer is not really executing queries; it's a data orchestrator. It's determining it's determining of the query plan that it's going to push to those domains to bring back that data, and then within the federated access layer. It, depending on the nature of the request, it may have to handle composition and aggregation in the federated access layer. Again, when it's building a query plan, if it's possible, it'll try to push those down into the individual domain uh, systems because the, the idea is that they're likely to be, uh, if we can perform those operations closer to where the data lives, they'll be more efficient. Uh, but But occasionally they have to be they have to be handled within the federated data access layer as well. Um, I can imagine that. Uh, what, what that begs the question, right? So let's say you're the architect, you provided this uh, blueprint of a system that does everything we've just discussed. Um, it's brilliant. But unfortunately, not my fault, somebody else did it, but my runtime uh, in my domain is not quite up to the standards, right? How do I... Like, should I bring this crappy runtime to you? Like, uh, what is the expectation of me? Like, what is our contract? You're talking about a, what are the minimum requirements for a domain to to participate or? Or I'm not sure of the runtime. And I feel like if I bring my data product into this federated data access layer, uh, I might not be able to handle uh, the kind of queries you might send my way. There's a bunch of edge cases that you're going to have to just address, right? Um, I think that if the if the federated sort of composition and aggregation capabilities aren't sufficient, you may need to do that work outside of the federated data access layer in some way, right? Um, if uh, so, an, an example would be, let's say it's some sort of fuzzy composition logic where well, depending on this factor or this factor, I might bring these two things together or I might bring this other thing together. It's not likely that that those sorts of that sort of fuzzy composition logic is going to be in the federated data access layer. I would argue that's almost business logic. And the minute you get to the, if the filters, the joins, composition logic, et cetera, gets so complicated, I would argue you're you're getting into the area of business logic and business logic needs to sit in the domains right, right. so right. those domains can build their own analytical views and they probably ought to um and they can be surfaced as data products as well but again you have to understand if 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 the federated data access layer isn't isn't fulfilling enough of the analytical needs then those things have to be built within a domain the other one which which you did mention but comes to mind is cross-domain analytics, right? That gets right. sort of complicated as well. I, I think if, if the cross-domain analytics can be solved for through the federated data access layer for a given consumer, that's the obvious choice. But in the same vein, if there is complex, maybe new business logic that needs to be introduced to create some cross-domain analytic, I probably would create a new domain, like an analytics domain to handle those sorts of things. Kind of like you build an enterprise data warehouse for certain reasons, right? Understood. Is, is that uh, a recommended thing? Do you, do you like the idea of having to do it or is it like- a... An analytics domain? 
I think I think uh, if it's justified, it has to meet the parameters that I just said. You have tr meaningful business logic that you need to introduce into an analysis, and it's exactly. clearly process domains. Then I think that makes sense to do. Um, I mean, if it's inefficient for whatever reason, you could sort of isolate and segment that within within an existing domain. But I would make sure you want to call that out as a as a separate unique case, maybe manage it differently. Um, the other, um, so, so I'll leave it at that. So those those are some of the things you need to think about if you're imagining that you want to move in this direction. Understood. That, that, that kind of answers my question, right? That as, as a domain, first of all, I'm responsible for the runtime. If I don't like the nature of a runtime that is governed by um, either the systems I use or the lack of business logic that I've yet provided uh, for this runtime to exist, I need to take care of that. That's my share of the contract when I come to this federated data access layer. Yeah. That, that brings um, up another one. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think it's yeah, another absolutely. one, which is occasionally you'll get someone who comes along and goes like, well, this isn't going to work for me. I have to move 100 gig of data you know, once an hour from point A to point B like and it crosses domains. My 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 response to that is you probably haven't defined your domains effectively. It's a domain boundary problem. And you really should think about trying to isolate your heavy workloads in the domain. Right. Right. And I, I, I guess to me, when somebody says I need to do this, I need to move uh, you know, like a truckload of data from point A to point B. I think that that sets off an alarm bell in my mind, right? That, hey, you, you don't need to do that. You need to solve a business use case using the data that you have. Well, you don't well, need probably, to run the ETL. Probably reacting to some constraint that they imagine is there. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and like I was describing, maybe it's it's because we have different owners of something and they, they imagine they have to move this data in this particular way, right? And yeah, I think just rethinking the domain boundaries and how that exchange should happen is a better way to kind of solve this. That 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 makes sense to me. All right, uh, Ken, this has been a very fruitful discussion. Um, uh, lots to learn, lots to also kind of deep dive into. Um, we have we are uh, at at the end of the hour. Um, I I just folks on the call. I just want to take a couple of more minutes to um, just jump into one like crystallization of pretty much everything we've spoken about and overlaying, let's say, some of the different categories of tools uh, that are available in the ecosystem. So th th this is a diagram that that Ken's come up with. Um, so if you look at the uh, uh, th this particular diagram that you're looking at, um, you have certain gaps in the access and control layer that exist and are not serving the requirements that we all just kind of spoke about. And uh, uh, what the essence of Ken's insights, Ken's learnings from doing this uh, uh, for several years in enterprises is that there is a need for, first of all, a unified semantic layer, you know, the, 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 the byproduct of, um, uh, this consistent metadata that can make sense of uh, a heterogeneous um, system uh, inside an organization and an access layer that is capable of doing, uh, providing the services that we spoke about, providing that, that query planning and consistent access pattern across multiple domains, regardless of what those domains are composed of. Um, I'm going to find a way to share these resources in a follow-up email but a lot of what we spoke about is crystallized into this diagram. So as a, as a takeaway uh, uh, task for you, if you're interested in this topic, uh, do spend some time uh, kind of thinking through these two diagrams. Uh, if these two slides make sense to you, you've understood this webinar and everything else that follows. If you haven't, please feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to kind of uh, uh, understand your ecosystem, your stack and uh, try and unravel this diagram for you and what it means for you to build uh, this kind of uh, uh, metadata-driven federated data access layer. 
Um, apologies, we don't have the time to get into a lot of detail on this in this particular webinar, but we will be following up with more webinars that deep dive into some of the topics we spoke about, um, stuff like data catalogs and their role in an access layer um, and how there's room for collaboration and so on. Um, lots of interesting topics, like I uh, mentioned, this is the first in this series of uh, uh, webinars. Do check out hustler.io slash uh, events for more of these uh, webinars. Again, no need to remember that URL. I'll be sending it across to you in a follow-up email. And uh, if there are any questions, we'd be happy to uh, take them now or uh, you can write to us as well. So I'll stop sharing and we'll see if there are any uh, questions. There, there is one. Um, and I think maybe you could respond to Nitin Wana off, offline. Um, I, can, I can do that. Let me. Multi cloud deployments and Terraform. Let me just take this. Um, I can't see. It's in the QA. Uh, okay, I can see the QA. How can I handle multi cloud deployments? Is uh, Terraform supported? Uh, yes, Nitin, it is in case you're still here. Um, it's the metadata can be manipulated however you want, and you can write everything from a GitHub action in the simplest form to a Terraform uh, a script to provision infrastructure, pick the latest copy of Hasira's metadata and deploy it in servers that um, uh, that you're interested in deploying it to. Um, all very straightforward. A lot of our users uh, use Terraform for the provisioning of uh, infrastructure part, and then you can use something like Jenkins to apply um, uh, the, the Hasura metadata or spin up Hasura containers if you'd like, or you can do something in between depending on how you do this. But it's all programmatic. That's one of the biggest advantages of being metadata driven. You can make it do whatever you want, right? It's all configuration driven, um, all programmable, and uh, you can implement it in whichever um, automation, uh, whichever part of your automation stack that you want to. So that's the concise answer to this, but if you have more questions about this, we can uh, set up a one-on-one -on -one session. All right. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you so much, folks, and thank you so much, Ken, for uh, uh, this wonderful session, and hope to see you all in the next one. Thank you, everyone.